welcome to the podcast. We're KMSS. So our guest today is Dr. Dean Keshwagi. He is a world-renowned researcher, innovator, in the best approach for in the best value approach for over 25 years. His program educates, assists organizations in becoming efficient through measurement, accountability, and transparency. He's an accomplished author and has won numerous awards, too many to mention here. The most recent was changing an entire country on how to buy professional services. He enjoys that with Netherlands, yeah? Yes. Yeah, okay. They need, they need teaching over there. I, I was just over there. Um, he enjoys educating and preparing the next generation of professionals. Uh, was formerly with uh, Arizona State University and now is uh, working at KSM Inc., which is the Kashwagi Solutions Model Inc. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what the Kashwagi Solutions Model is? Well, Dr. Dean, we call you Dr. Dean, right? Is that what people call you? That is fine. Yeah, that's fine? Yeah, that is fine. Okay. Our whole philosophy is uh, we think that people are the source of risk. And they're a source of risk because we have more people who are non-observant than observant. Non-observant people being people who can't look at reality and accurately tell you what's going on. So these people like to think, they get confused a lot, and then they start making decisions. I think I'm one of those people. So looking into the future, all we have to do to mitigate risk which will lower costs and improve value at the same time, is stop people from thinking and making decisions. So we created these whole group of simple models that make it very clear to people that if they start thinking, it's never going to lead to anything good. I get, I can be, I can be straight. <laughs> and ever since I've met you, we've, we've talked about this. Your, your, your lead off here always yes. attacks my sensibilities. Oh, but yeah, hey, but I, yes. I'm not I, unusual in that, I think, right? <laughs> people people yeah. think too much. We've got to stop them from thinking. That's, I hear that. Well, the only people who really think a lot are people who are confused, right? I, hey, because if they knew the exact answer. My wife says answer, I have cockroaches in my head, so I'm confused yeah. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if they knew the answer, they would simply explain it. But when they don't understand the answer because things look too complex, then they start thinking. And people start thinking stress goes up. They try to get all the data they can get. And we've had tests proving that people use too much data and then they make a decision. Then they cause risk. And so if that's what's going on and we look at the environment and everybody quickly recognizes that we're moving toward automation, robotics, anything that can be done by an information system or automated is automated. So we quickly say, hmm, What's causing a risk? It's people thinking. So we created models that show that thinking is not something you want to do if you want to be successful in life later. So the assumption most people is risk is caused by ignorance. That's what it is. Okay. And when people are ignorant, the first thing they do, which they cannot control, they start thinking. Okay, but so... If I'm if I'm in a okay, so if I'm put in a situation that I is new to me or I don't understand. Yes. Okay. And I have to perform. First thing I do is start collecting information. Start yes. Start collecting data. Yes. Start trying to understand the situation. Yes. For me. Are you saying that that's not the right thing to do? That is the traditional way to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. But in the future, when we have to minimize risk, lower cost, and improve performance at the same time. No, what you're doing is not very efficient. Okay, so going from here, tell me a little bit about how you developed this line of thinking and this approach, and, and then um, and a little bit about your background. Well, basically, I was with the Air Force. So I was with the Air Force for 14 years. Okay. And um, what did you do with the Air Force? For some reason, they made me a consultant from the, from the get-go almost. And uh, I quickly realized that why they promoted me or why they tried to educate me even more and the jobs I had, I quickly realized that they didn't know what to do with me. So they put me into situations where there were problems, but everybody was well accepting of the problems. Only I wasn't. I wanted to know why the problems occurred. Did they put you in the situation to solve the problem? 
No. That wasn't the goal. No. What was the goal? The goal was to put me there because somebody, there was a slot there. And、uh, if they didn't fill the slot with somebody who had a master's degree, or somebody who wrote a lot, or somebody who seemed like they were intelligent, they would lose the slot. Oh, so it was just to keep the quota? Keep the quota. Yes. Okay. And so I seem to find these jobs. And they always put me in a place, there's no job, but here I am. So I quickly look around and go, what am I going to do for three years? And they tell me, create a job for yourself in the most bureaucratic, right, rule oriented type of organization, which is the military. Well, basically, I'd look around and go, well, I have to do something. So I ask everybody, what are you doing? And they tell me what they're doing. And I say, how well is it working? And the traditional answer, no one really knows. I say, how can you be doing this and you don't know if it's working? And you're spending $100 million on it. They go, well, we're just moving ahead and everybody's really happy with the direction. And so I said, well, Just a simple minded person would try to find out right now what we're going to end up with in five years, especially if we're going to spend $100 million. And I quickly began to realize that very few people are accountable. Very, people, very few people actually understood what was going on. But I just had a gift of making it simple. And I never asked for permission because I didn't have a job. You don't have to ask for permission. <laughs> so. <laughs> I'd go and find a very simple answer and lay it out simply to people where they wouldn't have to think about it. See, when people have to think about what you're presenting, then they're going into the decision making mode. And it sustains bureaucracy because all bureaucracy is is a whole bunch of people thinking, making decisions, collaborating. Some would argue that it's people not making decisions. Pardon? Some people would argue that bureaucracy is,、uh, is not making decisions. Oh, no, just, but they are. It's just a continuous process of moving things along with it. Oh, no,、them. but they really are. Yeah, you think that,、uh, like, I remember this guy up at uh, uh, the FAA, and <laughs> I was brought into the organization. And I said, I know a, a simple way to minimize 90% of the thinking and really minimize the need for 90% of the people here. And I would have all the information, and I wouldn't need any of these people to help me. It would come from the people who are actually accountable and responsible for doing what they're supposed to be doing. In other words, we have a supply chain. It's inefficient, which means it's too long and there's too many people in it. So we're just going to simply remove all the components that do what? Think and make decisions. And this fellow brought me in his office. He says, Dr. Dean, you don't realize what's going on here. I said, Hmm. He said, What's on your mind? He said, We don't change anything around here. I said, Why would you have that approach? He said, Because when you don't change anything, everybody keeps their job. And he said, You will too. If you learn that we don't change anything. I said, well, that's interesting. So the goal is to do nothing. So his goal was to do nothing. But in doing nothing, he actually had to gain information so he could stop anything that would change something. So he was actually thinking and making decisions all the time. But he didn't realize it. And somebody just looking at him said, This guy sits there and he does nothing. So, how can that be? How can thinking and making decisions be the source of the problem? Because this guy is the source of the problem. But it's just very complex and confusing because how he does his thinking and decision making. So, what we've been able to do is we've been able to create extremes. And the extremes are. On one side, they're observant people. Observant people see into the future. On the other side, we have non observant people. They cannot see into the future. 
So they're more likely to get confused. So these non-observant people, when get, they get confused, immediately start thinking. And why? Because they can't control that. That is what a human being is. You get them confused, they start thinking. Stress level goes up. They try to collect all the information, but they have no way of understanding because the information is already there around us. They just can't link it together. And so basically they start making decisions. Then when they make decisions, they have to actually direct other people on what to do to try to ensure that their decision turns out to be right, which over time you can quickly identify that these people never lead to successful solutions. And you ask yourself, why does this go on and on? And the answer is because it's part of the event. It's always gone on. Except we have factors now in our, in our environment that are making this type of approach very risky. And the factors are the amount of automation, robotics that are going on, turning to information systems. When people start thinking and making decisions, it's so easy to see that they're a source of risk because they're inconsistent. They don't solve the problem quickly enough. And so everyone knows the solution to every problem is to minimize the participation of people who think and make decisions. What isn't, I mean, okay, so <laughs> we look at automation. I've heard recently that, you know, there's going to be automation in 65% of the jobs that exist today are going to be automated at some capacity, even jobs that we might term as intellectual jobs from legal to whatever. They're all going Absolutely. to be automated at some point. Absolutely. Uh, but isn't the goal of automation to relieve us from the mundane tasks so that we can think more creatively? Is that... No, the goal of automation is to create effectiveness and efficiency, mm -hmm. to cut costs and improve the quality that we're getting. It's a business. Well, sure, it's a business. But and therefore... Part of that is, but that's to take the mundane tasks and turn them into things that, because they can be automated quickly and they can be managed quickly. Now, machines are thinking now more than they have in the past. So driverless cars and so forth are coming out to be. But part of that is to make it a, is to reduce the decision making that has to occur in the car to make it simpler. But we, at some point, the idea is to allow the people who are visionary and maybe observant to have more time to do that. No? No, I disagree. Okay. Well, this isn't unusual. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I think the reason for automation is to increase profits, in, improve Absolutely. value and quality I don't through effectiveness that. and efficiency. Yeah. Let me give you a good example. This thing about the, uh, the autonomous cars. You think, I'm in an autonomous car. I don't have to think as much. I don't even have to see. I mean, if I try to turn the wheel, and it's going to lead to an accident, I get multiple beepers. I actually I rented a car uh, back in Houston, so a couple months ago, and the seat, whenever I tried to do something, quote, that caused risk, almost lifted off the floor and was vibrating me to death. I said, that's amazing. All right? You think about this. If I don't have to think now, I don't need information. I don't have to make any decisions. Risk is going to go way down. Does this make sense? Sure. And you would think, everybody would love this. Well, a couple of simple observations. When technology is successful, it is always because it minimizes the need to think and make decisions. Right? It's a good thing. Right. But it's not a good thing for everybody. There's but it some also people, allows me to be creative. So well, technology and software today allows, be, it, it takes care of things that I don't have to deal with anymore and it allows me to be creative and frees me up from having to deal with things that I otherwise would have to deal with. That's a, that's a level of efficiency. Well, the ability to be creative, the ability to create new things which are already there because there's nothing that's totally new. It's people able to observe and create things that no one before has thought about in that way, right? Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Creativity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the number of creative people in life are very few. 
Like you have observant people, you have non-observant people. The creative people are on which spectrum? It's the observant. They can actually see something that other people can't see. Okay. But many people in the non-observant group think that maybe if they didn't have to do what they have to do, that they would be creative. That's totally inaccurate. In other words, okay. creative people are not constrained by what So do you believe that creativity is something that you're born with or you're not born with? Oh, it has to be born with you, right? Yeah. Cause because actually, today... Because I actually have seen a study, and we, we, <laughs> we talk about it in some of our programs here, that shows that when people are younger, yes. they, have, they have a higher level of creative genius in them, and then it gets worked out of them as they get older because they go through school and they're taught... And, and the borders are put around them, and they said, this is the way you have to think, et cetera, et cetera. And it's kind of pushed out of them. And there's a study by NASA that shows that this is the case. But it sounds like you think that would, that's not true. Uh, I don't think that's actually 100% accurate. In other words, we have enough data and tests today that they know that there's a second genetic system in every human being. And it's called the epigenetic system. And the epigenetic system is actually a tributary or controls everything that we can change in our lives. Now think about this. What, how can you, can you change the color of your eyes over your lifetime? The answer is no, that's genetic. But the epigenetic system <coughs> denies or gives access to our living organisms in our body to genetic information that is already there. Well, if it cuts off access to the information, then people aren't going to be able to optimize their lifestyle. For example, if you eat healthier, your lifestyle will change. You may live longer. Yeah. If you sleep more, it's good for you. Right? You'll be healthier. All these things that you can do that affect a change in your life while you're living which means anything that's not attributed strictly to genetics is to attribute to the epigenetic system. Well, the breakthrough came when they found out that everything you can change that actually is attributed to this epigenetic system is actually in you before you're born. In other words, how you're going to interface with your environment, how you're going to be raised, what you're going to do is actually in you, you're predisposed. So therefore, if somebody had all the information, they could actually predict someone's total life. But even without the information, they can kind of see this. So we have all these examples now that support it. But now that we know people are predisposed, no one's ever at the wrong place at the wrong time. And by observation, Everyone can only be at one place at one time, and that's controlled by natural law. Okay, so let's get in. I know I've talked to you before. Talk to me about your views on natural law and how it impacts predictability. Well, natural laws <clears throat> basically are independent of time. So before we discovered gravity, objects still fell. We just didn't understand what that natural law of gravity was. And so basically... Natural laws always exist. There is nothing that we have observed in the world that is not subject to natural laws. So basically how they change, the rate of change, is all dictated by natural law. Therefore, once you understand this, you begin to understand that if you understand all the natural laws and the existing conditions, your ability to predict the future becomes very easy. And the more people understand of reality, which is just made up of unique conditions and natural laws, okay, so this gets the more the, that they can see. This gets to the heart of uh, the question, because I've actually had the conversation here, um, sometimes related to your program, sometimes not, actually. But there are people uh, on two sides of, of an aisle that I see that there are people who believe <laughs> that if you have enough information and you have enough data, you can predict almost any outcome. That is correct, yeah. Okay. I believe that also. And then, I agree with that. But then there are people who believe that there's too many complexities and too many variabilities going on in the world that are not 
foreseeable from a certain point of view to be able to predict an outcome. Yes. Okay. So how do you, how do you argue with those folks? You don't. Okay. The people who believe that the world is complex, we just ask ourselves a simple question about them. Do they understand reality better or not as well? Well, the more complex things seem, people are non-observant. You can never convince or influence anyone. Because if you could, you could actually like radically change the history of mankind. But because more people are non-observant, what we do is we find ways to find the observant people. And if somebody is observant, but they don't have enough observant people around them, which means the people are more humanistic, right? They're always confused. They can't understand what's going to happen the next day. They can't tell the difference. And these people have certain humanistic characteristics which force them to think and make decisions and always think of who first? Themselves. You can't stop this. But what we have actually developed now is the logic without knowing anything, because if you had to know everything, you couldn't do this. So our logic actually identifies without knowing anything. We can know almost everything. And this is by making things simple and using natural laws. So basically, we've gone out and tested this. In order to test this, you have to test it with people who can actually simplify their thought, who can see into the future. So we understand that most people are non-observant. So when we meet non-observant people, we try to like discuss their, their feelings, but we never try to change them or, or try to educate them out of it simply because you're educating the wrong people. When you have to educate more, the people are non-observant. Otherwise, they would have seen it. When you expect change, your risk goes up. So what we try to do is find people who can actually see this and then get those people to utilize a system where if they can understand what's going on, they can actually get other people who don't have to understand because the system, the structure of it all, will take care of all the problems. Okay, so give me a, give me a <laughs> practical example where this has been applied and been successful. Okay. The greatest uh, test we've had was with the U.S. Army Medical Command. So we ran about four or five years with them. And <laughs> they listened to the logic. They understood what was causing risk. So we put a structure in place that was very simplistic. That in the end, over five or six years, completely stopped disagreements. And it minimized, of course, the the project costs and time deviations because when everybody understands, you have transparency. Nobody, unless they understand what to do, will do anything. And so it disables people from thinking and making decisions and then allows the expert who knows the most about the situation to actually go and do the situation with the least amount of communication with people who don't understand. Did. So, and it would it went it was phenomenal. So, give us what was the situation, what was the change, and what was the outcome? Well, basically, we went into this organization, and they were utilizing six different vendors, like a job order contracting, you know, where uh, they would have a contract with these six vendors, and the vendors now would just compete for smaller tasks, or the projects could be maybe a million dollars, right? And there are twenty six different sites. And of course, you have all these stakeholders walking around, right? Many of the stakeholders, it's a military system, so many of the stakeholders don't even care if they make a mistake or cause other people to do things that, that are not accurate or not effective or efficient. They don't care because they're short term. So what we have to do is put a system in place now that actually pacifies all these people, creates transparency where they don't have to think, and see if it works. And over five years, it was phenomenal. I think we had one disagreement. Probably had maybe up to 1,000 jobs, 26 different sites. One disagreement the whole time. And the only reason they stopped that was that somebody came in after the visionary retired and said, this transparency does not allow me to make decisions 
where I can just make the decision and don't have to worry about what I decided. And the person said, this actually constrains me to ch in controlling things. And so I need to shut this thing down. Because if this thing keeps going, I make a decision, it leads to a result. My decision making is actually documented and everybody knows who caused the problem. So this person uh, over the course of one to two years shut the whole system down. And that's the only way you can shut it down. Because when you have transparency, everybody knows what's going on. Yeah. Now it assists everybody if they don't know anything not to say anything and you mitigate all the risk. So risk is actually caused by people who don't understand. And why would somebody do this? Well, think about this. This is a form of automation. Right. It can actually save an organization, I would say easily 30% of all their cost. And they never would have to manage, direct, and control someone. And they would have access to the expertise in every area that they needed. And because of the transparency and the characteristics of expertise and the structure of the system, it would totally automate all the thinking and decision making out of the organization, which means they would need probably 80% less people, the cost would drastically dive, and the performance would increase and they wouldn't even have to give up control because they would have the control that the transparency brings. In other words, they would always know where they are, what their costs are, how much improvement they have, what the improvement was. It would be a totally transparent environment. But yet, with the majority of people not being able to see. It's, uh, to us, it's the most unbelievable technology. And we know it's simple, it's easy to do, as long as somebody understands. So we know it has all the trappings of automation. Now, people are very afraid of automation, right? Very afraid. Because as soon as somebody says, we're going to automate your job away, they immediately try to defend their position. So we know that's going on. But we see the environment. We see the future. We actually see it going this way. When anybody complains or like the people, union people felt like they weren't being paid enough for flipping burgers or, or getting change out or doing this or that, you can immediately recognize what the result is over time. The number of jobs decrease. The need for people who, quote, are non-observant, who need to think a lot, who don't understand exactly what their impact is on the company or on everything else, uh, they have a problem. They uh, actually need to really become more accountable. So here's the irony. Of, and I've been through several of these conversations yes. with you. Yes. And this is the irony that comes out of it, because clearly I'm one of the non-observers. But Oh, no, we never, we never agreed on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but when I, when I look at, because I'm, I'm one of these folks who talks about, who believes in, maybe it's just my background, but I believe in the idea of creating responsive organizations based on the idea that there's unpredictable things out there. When we yes. get down to what the result are, is of that, Yes. what do we promote? Complete transparency. Yes. Simple rules. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, getting down to the, you know, the, the and I, I work with one of your disciples, Yes. Who, who's very who I like very much, and he and I have had to agree to disagree. But when we come down and with what are the programs that we want to promote, yes, the results are the same. It right? looks it looks very it looks very similar, similar. Yes. and it comes out. And it, so if I whether I believe the world is predictable or if I believe the world is unpredictable, yes, I'm still you know creating simple rules for people to or people or for machine whatever the base level is, I'm, yes. I'm promoting transparency, I'm energizing people, I'm hiring the right yes. talent and firing the right, the, the, pe the people who don't add or contribute value. So the results are the same. Well, so they, they seem very similar. They seem yes. similar. Yes. How is it different? 
Well, it's different in the fact that our model requires less people, is simpler, and it's actually been tested over and over and over to show it's very successful. I don't know if that's, that's different in the, in, in the theoretical result, though. So I might argue that because, because it comes down to a, the same uh, approach in the end, or a very similar approach in the end, that um, it might be that the, the results are, are, are just proving out. Right, so whether I believe the world is predictable, or I believe the world's unpredictable, whether I believe there's observant people or non-observant, if I believe that people can't change the way they act or think yes. over time, or if I believe that the world is uh, unpredictable and that people can develop themselves and develop their thinking, but at base level, if we're promoting the same things, we're going to end up with the similar proven results. Well, let's let's uh, make it real simple. Because that's what you if do. If what I'm proposing... You make things simple. We would need less people. Mm -hmm. We would totally minimize thinking and decision-making. Mm -hmm. We would shorten the supply chain. Mm -hmm. And you could actually document that at the end of a year of operating this, you would have at least 30% cost savings. What about contingency plan? Do you do contingency planning? Because if you believe everything's predictable, then I don't have a contingency that I need. Right. Uh, the contingency is almost in, uh, it's not in existence. It, it normally is never used. It's, uh, it's just not required mm. because it's predictable. And the people who are experts will minimize their risk by minimizing their scope. And they will utilize expertise. And they already know that their experts are not thinking or making decisions because when somebody's thinking and making decisions, they actually don't know what they do well enough to be able to predict what's going to happen. And so, therefore, okay. in the simplest application, is all we're promoting is a system where visionaries can take individuals and get 10 times as much out of them. Can you expand a little bit on that role of the expert? <laughs> yes. The expert is the one who you don't have to tell what to do. Because if you have to tell him what to do, he's not an expert. How do you become an expert? Uh, you become an expert. To trial and error. In actuality, the day you're born. And through your unique this is where I have a hard track time. through life, you become an expert but that assumes, because of who you are. That assumes that I can't affect who I'm going to be in the future. You can't. I can't. Yes. So you're not saying I'm born a certain way and that's my path and I can't. Okay. I can't deviate. Let me let me path. explain it in this way. If you cannot accept people for who they are, which means you want to manage, direct, and control them because you believe you have some influence and ability to change them, right? Does this increase or decrease risk? I'm not sure. I believe that I, no, can, if you, I, I can influence people. I do believe okay, that I can influence people. Okay, but I'm just asking Especially you, my kids. Yes, right? I, I'm yeah. just asking you yeah. that yeah. if you have to take somebody and tell them what to do, does this increase or decrease risk? But it increases risk. Yes. Right. So we have just said, that's so simple. So but we're I not going to... So I we're can not guide people. Pardon? Because there's people who need to learn. They need to learn. And oh. I, okay, so I have... I have a guy coming in here, uh, and it's funny because this is a millennial world right now, right? Yes. And they come in, and they're coming into a, a, a situation wearing, you know, uh, wrinkled shirts and blood on it. And it's like, I had actually a guy come in as an intern with blood on his shirt <laughs> to work one day, <laughs> you know? And I have to teach him. I have to guide him. I think yes. he's a very smart guy, and he's going to do a very good yes. job and all this, but yes. I have to guide people that that's not the way you come in to work because you're going to lose trust from people and you're not going to be people are going to be distracted and all that they're not going to listen to you so yes i can guide people i can influence him and next day he comes in i actually said don't come into this office until you're dressed for work right i've seen him since so that's a millennial thing <laughs> so but you know we guide them in how to how to behave how to interact and all this in his core we hire him because he's smart we know he's smart. He's proven he's smart. He's got things that he does well. 
and he's got innate abilities, but still need guidance and influence in order to bring those abilities out. But what I'm proposing to you is that the more you have to guide him, your risk is higher. And just like this guy, you try to guide him, and you never saw him again, right? Well, no, I'm kidding. That's oh, no, no, but, but I've seen this. Yeah. I mean, we've tracked students, people, adults. We've tracked this in marriage with kids. And I can honestly tell you that if you can accept who you are and your environment and understand who you are, you will begin to understand everyone else, and you'll be able to predict their future. Okay. And, and therefore, when you can predict their future and you don't have to try to change them in any way because I think it's pretty much a dominant fact in life, people are accountable for their own actions. In other words, if I have accountable people on this side and non-accountable people on this side, if I wanted a successful business, I would hire accountable people. Mm -hmm. Accountable people, the first thing they do is realize that they're not there by chance. And they have to make certain decisions in their life that have to change their life. The non-accountable people, as a general rule, this is a law of nature, will always think that there is a disconnect between where they are and who they are. Therefore, if anything goes wrong, they are more apt to be confused and blame other people. So interesting, interesting. These are simple concepts. Interesting yeah. juxtaposition because, and, and it won't show this way on the podcast, but go listen to Karen Walsh's podcast when this one comes out. Because one of the things that we were talking about is uh, in her approach to quantum negotiation is the ability for people to style shift. So you're brought up with certain things that are inside you. Yes. Okay. Yes. There's a, things that affect you emotionally based on your experiences or even what you were born with or whatever that comes out and it creates stress or it creates a situation where you have a hard time seeing what's in front of you. And so in her, in her case, coming to negotiation, you are um, affected by that and it affects your ability to negotiate and come to a conclusion. And, and, and that getting, is, getting control yes. of that and understanding that in yourself allows you to negotiate better. But what she's saying is that then allows you to potentially see what the other person needs and then style shift to match their needs. And that is why I would disagree with her. Okay. Because I do not believe that negotiation minimizes risk. Because people have to think, they have to make decisions, and the only reason they're making decisions is to protect their position. And but anybody we, who believes that they can influence someone else and change them is actually increasing risk and not decreasing actually, risk. Actually, I think it's just the opposite. It's moving toward changing your, changing your view and moving towards them and understanding them better, not trying to change them, but to get to, because you, you make deals all the time. Everybody negotiates a deal. You negotiate a deal every time you sign a consulting agreement or you go work with, with somebody, right? But see, here's the difference. If we have to negotiate anything, it's more likely we're just not going to do that work because we already know that some of the concepts are inaccurate. We already know it doesn't align with us, so we just don't do it. That is the difference with us. Hmm. And so what we try to do is find clients and organizations that realize that their biggest risk are their own people. And that if they try to influence or modify people's behavior, their risk goes up. And we clearly know they're more non-observant people than observant people in reality. So what we're looking for is a few observant people who can understand that if you shorten the supply chain and minimize the need to collaborate and communicate and educate and mentor, that their risk will go down and their performance will take a drastic increase. And if we don't find that client who actually understands that simply, then we're outside of our expertise. So you deal with a lot with supply chains. Yes. Aren't, am I not negotiating within my supply chain with people? Or am I just fine? Normally, that? traditionally, you are. Yeah. Yes. So do you eliminate that? Oh, absolutely. How do you eliminate that? You eliminate that 
by making sure that everyone in your supply chain knows exactly who they are and can see into the future. Okay. How do I see into the future? Simple. I know this is a podcast and they won't be able to see this. But when I release this and run 100 tests, what percent of the time after I release this is the bottle going to stay right there? Zero. Zero. And the only reason that you can say that is because you can what? See into the future. And what people don't realize is, if you want to know who can see in the future, just ask them, what do you see in the future? And the people who can't will tell you what? It's not possible. And the people who can will tell you what they see. Therefore, you quickly begin to understand that the people who can see need minimal information because they understand reality and they understand natural laws. So you don't have to explain. So whereas people are doing things like educating, leveling the playing field, trying to increase comp the competitive nature by taking information from those who know it and sharing with it everybody, that is very ineffective, inefficient, and will not change things much. But the best thing about those kind of concepts are that most people are not observant, and they need that. So those ideas will be very popular. And I totally agree that they're popular and why they're popular. But we're not in that business. <laughs> we're in the business of looking at the environment and realizing that automation, information systems, are going to take over the world. And if people don't realize that or actually implement it and understand that these systems minimize the need to think, minimize the need to make decisions, and predict the future outcome, and that's how these systems all work, then they don't understand what we're proposing in automating the thinking and decision-making out of human beings. So let's talk a little bit about, um, <laughs> let's talk about your influences a little bit. When, when you came up and you've been exploring these ideas and forming your, your concepts, yes. were there any people who influenced you greatly in that process, or was it mostly just based on your experience? Well, the logic we have, that information is already there, quickly identified myself based on my position and what I understood and what I didn't understand as my capability. For example, when I was 13 years old, I wanted to know what I was going to do for the rest of my life. So I asked my parents. And they said, nobody knows that. Well, that's not an acceptable answer, right? I mean, if other people have more experience, if they actually understand reality, they can give me a simple answer. Well, now I have that simple answer. So now I teach the people I'm mentoring. And I clearly tell them, the only reason you have access to this is because you're ready for the information. However, you're still constrained as far as how quickly you can process this, even if it's simple and it's right in front of your face. You are constrained by who you are. So you just have to do the best you can. But I realized as I came through life, I had to experience many of these ideas because I wasn't that intelligent. I couldn't understand. So some things I saw like 10, 20, 30, 40 times. Simple things, like you try to influence your children. The more you influence your children, or try to attempt to influence your children, later on you'll find out that you can't influence them, right? You'll find out that who they are is who they are, that they're predisposed. But this has been going on for ages where parents try to influence their kids, right? I mean, it's gone on for ages. Influence, and, guide. Um, what, whatever we might want to call it. Yeah, I mean, I have a kid. And I, <laughs> yes. don't, I have no doubt, one, that she's smarter than me, yes. and two, that she knows where she wants to go. But I also look at the environment she grew up in and the guidance that she received along the way, and I'd like to think that I had something to do with her success. You know, that gives us, like, satisfaction in our life. <laughs> However, when you look at this simply, everything's controlled by natural law. 
there's no such thing as chance, which means if people truly are accountable to who they are, basically they're never in the wrong place at the wrong time. And therefore, if now what we're finding out is that people are predisposed, it means they actually existed before they came here and where they are is who they are by natural law and they're very predictable and we begin to see this, right? That they can look at kids, the ages, they can look at the, uh, their environment and they can predict who these kids are. I mean, I'm always doing this because this just fascinates the heck out of me, right? I mean, I meet somebody and they tell me something, oh, that's really interesting. We run a test. They look at it. In the end, the person who can see says, that was amazing. We just ran a test with the state of Utah. That's amazing. Another person says, no, you guys were lucky. Oh, OK. Yeah, we were lucky, I guess. <laughs> So, people are who they I just, are. I just like to know that from the <laughs> womb, I was predisposed to interview you today. Um, There's no doubt in my mind that we're not sitting here by so chance. I'm okay. actually going to look at Wayne because yes. <laughs> Wayne, this is I think your first exposure to Dr. Kishwag. It is, and his ideas. I'd love to get your view because I know how I feel when the, each time I always get on the edge of my seat. Um, when you listen to these ideas, what, what are some of your immediate thoughts? Well, I, I tell you, I get a little torn because there, there are parts of it that, that make perfectly rational sense to me, and then there are parts that, that are a bit of a challenge for me to grasp. Um, the, the, the part, as you describe the expert, about the person that knows how things are going to turn out. Yes. I, I relate to that, right? Yes. I can see that as a, as a very reasonable concept. Yes. Um, where I have the bigger challenge is, how do you get people to stop making decisions? And that is an excellent question. And the answer is, you can't. Unless you have a structure put in place, which is really a rule, that stops them from making the decision. But in their mind, they're going through turmoil. Because normally, that's what they want to do, is think and make decisions. With the state of Utah test, we just ran on delivering an IT service. I told them, this is what you all have to do as stakeholders, nothing. I said, I don't even want you thinking. They said, what are you telling us? I said, we're going to run through this process. It's going to happen quickly, and you don't have to do anything. They said, what do you mean we don't have to think and make decisions? I said, if you have to make a decision, you're going to give it a status quo rating. They said, well, how do we know we're thinking? Because you looked at a paper that's so short, that, and it's two minutes, and you don't know what you're going to do. The default is, give it a, give it a default rating. And before they knew it, it was over. And they said, we're not comfortable at all with this. Then I showed them the information that came from the experts, that the structure drives to them. And I said, which one are you the most comfortable with? They said, that one. I said, that one is the guy who seems to have the most expertise, has the lowest cost, responded and can do everything you want. And you don't have to tell him anything because he's already laid it out from beginning to end and we're going to go through this, and it's a test. So if you still feel a little nervous, you're OK. You're, just don't do anything. And we're done with the test now. And they're looking at it going, that's amazing. And they ask me, how much do you know about IT systems and search engines? I go, absolutely nothing. I said, and if anybody makes me think immediately on my mind, because I created the system. That person's out of here. So don't make me think. Right? And uh, it's it is, it is not humanistic. That is why I'm proposing it's almost an automation. It's, it's like all this thinking and decision making and getting there, gone. I'm looking at what so one guy, right, can do the work of 10, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So as you bring this into an organization, right, how, how do you get this to mesh with the people's need that they create value? Ah, that's a good question. Because most people are non-observant. So you go into any organization, it's filled with people who want to think and make decisions to confirm that they have value. I absolutely agree with you. So the only way to make this successful is to find a visionary, identify the visionary, run a prototype test, document it heavily, and see if you can tell the difference between this visionary running a prototype test and what people traditionally do. If you have to think about what the difference is, that tells you what to do, right? It's, it's not worth it. But if it, by observation, you go, oh my goodness, we didn't save 1%, 2%. We saved 40%. Oh my goodness. And then when you realize that this system, when it's brought in by a visionary, he doesn't have to know anything. In other words, this whole system takes the position of a person who knows everything never needs to think. People take the position of we don't know almost anything, so therefore how can thinking not be a part of this, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's like this is my bread and butter to think and make decisions. It's my value. And we're saying, yeah, we agree that traditionally that's how people think, but we're headed toward what? Automation. What does automation mean? Take everything that causes risk, where you have to do work, where you have to think, where it looks complex, we're going to delete it. Now, who is going to be comfortable with this? Wow, that's a good question. And the answer is, when people know that they don't have to know anything, with one-tenth of people, they can get outstanding performance it's documented in terms of what everybody can observe and agree on, which means it makes it simple, cuts the cost, and increases the value. There are visionaries that are going to go, what? Is that possible? But it is definitely not well accepted by, I would say, 90% of all people. I would totally agree with you. right? And that's what causes the consternation, right? Well, it's funny because I was just thinking <laughs> yes. about the fact that um, whenever I'm observing a really stupid process, I, I turn to my wife and I say, there's some MBA who thinks they added value here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in the end, I, I, I do come to the point where <laughs> there's something, I, I really do think there's something to it. It's just, how do we get there? Yes. Um, what I want to do is, uh, so we have a, a, a workshop that we offer through the uh, Business Transformation Institute, the new transformative power of metrics, transparency, and simplicity. Uh, if I were to attend a workshop or hire my, uh, you to come and talk to my, my leadership or my teams, what am I going to learn from that workshop? How to do this. How to do this. Yes, in simple order. Yeah. If it's possible or not possible. I expand a little bit on how to do this. What, so if I come in, I, will, I usually would come in with some system or process that I need to work with? Or yes. What, yeah. yeah, you have a problem. And what our proposal is, is that this solution or approach will solve your problem mm -hmm. by drastically reducing your costs, minimizing the need for you to actually know what's going on, and bringing, so how's this identifying, and utilizing the expertise. Or Six Sigma or something like that? I don't think that they actually are looking at it simply enough at a higher level, which identifies and utilizes expertise. For example, many of these approaches, you actually need to get trained in it, right? You have to have the expertise. The difference with this is you don't have to know anything. So when you had an observation about it being kind of the second level, Yes, that this is kind of a, a follow-on to lean, right? Lean is, is simplifying everything and, and basically removing as much decision process as you can as you go through things, right, using a different methodology. And we were talking about how that's as, as opposed to a Six Sigma approach where it's very much the I gather, I analyze, I continue to think about stuff until I work through and develop some sort of solution. Is that a good description? It's uh, as accurate a something that I've heard in looking at the different systems. 
And this one is to the next level because it takes away all need to think. So the computer can do it. If the computer can do it, then I'm fine with it. But in the end, this upper level, it actually gets to stopping people from thinking and making decisions, right? I mean, which everybody goes from a lower level of understanding to a higher level. It's at the lower level of understanding that they're going to think more. They're going to make more decisions. They're going to make more mistakes. But people, if they understand this simply, will now say, oh my goodness, thinking and decision making, mistakes, they're all related. So I need to stop this. So therefore, I observe and accept what I see. And if I don't understand it, I go get an expert who's not thinking about this, who already knows what the answer is, right? Who can predict the future. And this is how people get from a lower level to a higher level. And so we <laughs> show the logic, very simply, of why it should work. Then we explain how many times we've made this work and where, and show the case studies. And then take whoever now can somewhat see this and say, what's your problem? and actually work them through on how to solve that problem with this approach. I, I can see where this very much takes the concept of lean really to the next level, right? You have lean eliminating kind of that first level of waste, and this kind of takes it to the next level of, yes. of getting that last remaining bit of human yes. interaction out of it. It takes the human out of it, is what it does, which is really an amazing concept. So it's really, it's total research. Now this year, what we're doing is we actually took this to Saudi Arabia in a country that has so like a lack of technology understanding where they're trying to come out of the desert in 70 years where they're trying to eliminate graft and collusion which always comes with people who have a lack of information and we're going to actually apply this to every contractor who does work in Saudi Arabia I mean we don't even believe ourselves yet until we see everything paid for that this is actually going to happen but this is one of our biggest efforts that we're going to do this year we also are with a huge organization that needs to minimize the number of management people and the cost but yet increase their performance and they're beginning to realize that because they're such a large organization that they have to find a theoretical, simple way to do this. Otherwise, the cost will spiral out of control, and they won't be able to sustain what they're trying to do. And we're working, of course, with the state of Utah, who is now going to take this and apply it in the HR area, right, where people don't really know what they're doing, make thinking and making decisions all the time to set what reality actually is and have these vendors motivate themselves to improve, which no one knows where they're at, and no one knows who they are. So is this even possible? I, I, we're going to work a project with the state of Utah on this. It's, it's going to be uh, after you do a few of these, total like, exciting. Like, yeah, after you do a few do. of these, I'd like to have you back yes. and learn what happened. And I'd also like to set up a debate on, on this, some of these concepts. Because in the end, it does come down to some very simple things that organizations can do to transform themselves. Yes, there's no and, doubt about it. And there's a lot of them that are, the concepts are the same. And um, I think one of the things that we're trying, what we're trying to promote here is that not every approach is going to work for everybody, although I, th I think you'd said this approach will work for everybody. But oh, no, no, no. Yeah. What, I, <laughs> what I said was, if the people understand that everything is governed by natural law, and conditions are always there, and they're always unique. Mm -hmm. They can apply this with very few resources and be very successful. Yeah. But it won't work where the masses are trying to collaborate, increase collaboration, increase communication and partnering and trust and all these things. It won't work there. Mm -hmm. So, so there's going to be a certain group of people this is going to really appeal to, and there's going to be people this is never going to appeal to. Oh, absolutely. And one of the things that we want to do is be open to different ways of thinking and approaching situations and and having an offering for people that are going to love just going to absolutely love this yes. so that's something that uh, we have on the docket what are some other areas places where people can find you 
Uh, they can find us at our website, ksm.com. Dash Inc. Dot com. KSM Dash Inc. Dot com. Dot com. Okay. Uh, they can find us on YouTube if they just put my name in and let's say best value approach. Best value approach on YouTube. Yeah, they have yes. a lot of lectures up there and a lot of yes. uh, videos uh, explaining this process. Yeah. Yes. Yep. And uh, and they can come to you all. They can come to MSSBTI.com. Because, yes, absolutely. Well, Doctor, it's always very interesting talking to you. I always leave a little bit irritated, a little bit stirred up, but I think that's a good thing. And we have to, we have to be willing to listen to different approaches to things. And, oh, absolutely. And, and I totally agree I think there's that. a, I think there's a lot of truth in what you're saying too. So I really appreciate the fact that you were willing to come in today and talk about it, knowing that I was going to challenge you a little bit. And uh, I think you enjoy that. So Wayne, any last thoughts? No, very good. Thank you for coming. Thank you very you much. You are welcome. And we'll, we'll sign out then. Thanks, Thank you. Sir.